computer. <clears throat> Excellent. So uh, welcome to the <clears throat> Rex pop-up call on Wednesday, January 31st, 2018. Uh, our guest is Jaime Cassio about how to survive the present. Uh, we're uh, we're going to take this interesting places. And uh, I will take us in with a poem by Muriel Rukeyser uh, titled Metaphor to Action, which goes as follows. Whether it is a speaker taught on a platform who battles a crowd with the hammers of his words, whether it is the crash of lips on lips after absence and wanting, we must close the circuits of ideas now generate that leap in the body's action or the mind's repose. Over us is a striking on the walls of the sky. Here are the dynamos, steel black, harboring flame. Here is the man night walking who derives tomorrow's manifestos from this midnight's meeting. Here we require the proof in solidarity, iron on iron, body on body, and the large single beating. And behind us in time are the men who second us as we continue. And near us is our love. No forced contempt, no refusal in dogma, the close of the circuit in a fierce dazzle of purity, and over us is night, a field of pansies unfolding, charging with heat its softness in a, in a symbol to weld and prepare for action, our mind's intensity. So what made you pick that one, Jerry? Uh, it was roughly instinct and then kind of this notion that um, metaphor is partly about framing, is partly about uh, how we communicate and express to each other. To me, to me, uh, uh, metaphors is, is such a huge part of our puzzle of how we get things done and uh, how we see forward that it felt like a good place to start. Metaphor, uh, futurism is an intrinsically metaphorical process. I mean, because we can't accurately describe exactly what will be, we can only describe things that are similar, you know, things that are metaphorical. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm, um, yeah, I, I'm glad you picked that one, although I, I was mildly disappointed you didn't pick uh, yeah, Eats the Second Coming. You know, things fall apart, the center does not hold, mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. <laughs> we, we can go there. The blood dim tide is loosened everywhere, the ceremony of innocence is drowned. The best lack all conviction and the worst are filled with passionate intensity. You should have told me. I could have had you recited at the start. <laughs> well, then it goes on to, you know, what rough beast slouches from Bethlehem or Jerusalem or something like that. It get, gets all religious and shit, but, uh, <laughs> um, I mean, the second coming, you know. Yeah, well. Um, good morning. Um, Mika, I see you there, although I don't see you there. Well, that's funny. Me too. Um. Now it's the time of monsters, yes. Uh, good Lord. I, I would say I boycotted... I to figure out what's going on there. Okay. Yeah. You're unmuted now. Yep. Okay. Um, there we go. There, there you are. are. There you are. Um, I would say I boycotted the uh, State of the Union address, but that's, that implies I ever had a plan to watch it. I find it very difficult to watch politicians speak, even ones that I agree with. Um, because it, I keep hearing the things that they didn't say. That is, you know, that they needed to say, but they don't. And it just makes me so frustrated because, you know, I'm, I've immersed myself in a, in a job, in a life path, really, that's been all about trying to figure out what might happen next. And to see people who are intrinsically responsible for the state of things when something happens next. Not embracing that responsibility, not accepting the consequences of their actions, of their choices. Um, it pains me. So can you give an example? Uh, like, I have a feeling some of those people might in fact be accepting the responsibilities of their actions and realizing that their actions seem really irresponsible and sort of going for it for some other motivation. No, no that, you're right. That's what You're I'm right. thinking. Yeah, some, um, some people out there sort of flinging shit at the fan are doing so on purpose. They have, they have some sort of reasoning. 
Right, and sometimes the reasoning is irrational. Um, you know, the, uh, the 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 line that I've seen a lot online is it you know more than a little scatological, but I think it you know, it makes sense that you know for for some of the hardcore conservatives they, they would eat shit if a liberal had to smell their breath. You know, it's that notion of um, you know their their responsibility, their sense of responsibility is for the in, infliction of pain on on opponents another and, another set of assumptions though maybe their 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 responsibility is for infliction of destruction on the system and if that means that their opponents have to like cry and scream and be frothy for a while that's okay because you got to break some eggs to make uh, to make an omelet um that's true i think there's multiple components but i yeah, I, yeah. I definitely agree with there is a there is a uh a value in trolling in and of itself that I see in my conservative friends. Yeah, well, well that, that, that's a whole side angle to it, but I'm, I'm trying to figure out what's, what's, the, what's the train and what's the snow that's blowing off the snowplow. And, and yeah. like, you know, how, how does this all kind of work? Because, uh, Jamey, you're walking through a series of things where you're, you're, I think, imputing a principal motivation or intent for a particular action. And I'm, I'm trying to explore that space a little bit. But I'm backcasting that, yeah. that intent. I, I'm not necessarily assuming the intent. I'm looking at the consequences and trying to figure out what would lead us there. Mm -hmm. You know, and so when you know, for a number of the statements that that you read, the the actions that are taken, not always by the political figures, but by their um, surrogates, by and political backers speakers, and... the surrogates, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, there seem to be few rational rational motivations and that may be my own you know my own blindness and i'm actually very willing to accept that it's blindness on my part and i would like to be able to understand things better uh, and, you know let me just say that one thing that i've been mulling since we since i agreed to do this this pop-up is that there has been one immutable law rule for foresight work and that is um people always overestimate the possibility of change in the short term and underestimate the degree of change in the long term. And it feels like this past year has upended that. Because to a large degree, it feels like so much has changed and is changing around us so quickly. And looking forward, it feels like nothing will get better. Nothing will change. Mm -hmm. And, and it, I don't know if that's true, but it certainly, it's truthy. It certainly feels true. Um, and I, it, it's actually posed a real problem for those of us who, who make a point out of trying to think about what happens next, because what happens next seems so disconnected from what's happening now. I don't know if you saw, if you ever watched Saturday Night Live, Oh, never. Um, I've never watched it. Anybody okay. else? We never watched never that. Watch it. Well, I don't know if you saw the most recent one with Jessica Chastain. They, one of the skits they did um, was uh, you know, in the guise of a game show, but the game show was called, you know, Does It, really Ma Does it Even Matter? Mm -hmm. And it was basically all of these scenes. If, if Trump does this, does it even matter? And the answer is always no. It doesn't even matter. Um, and that's what it feels like sometimes. And maybe I'm at, maybe I'm just sort of giving in to the desire to vent, but it's really frustrating. And I suspect that all of you feel a similar kind of frustration because we know that there are some big problems out there, not just related to the current political leadership, but big systemic problems, big environmental problems, economic issues that not only are not being addressed, they are being um, accelerated. Um, and then you layer on top of that this uh, cult-like behavior that's not just in the United States, by the way. I don't know if you saw that the new, the recently elected president of, Czech, of the Czech Republic refers to, himself, refers to himself as the Czech Trump. Oh, that's fun. Um, and you're seeing this similar kind of um, aggrieved nationalism showing up across Western nations. Does that make him a blank check? <laughs> 
Sorry, I couldn't help that. Uh, you know, we're rapidly approaching the point where that, that joke won't make sense. I know. That's terrible. <laughs> um, I was just see, I was reading something about Scott Pruitt, the EPA director, who was actually a Jeb Bush advisor, who was very assertive back in the campaign in 2016, saying that Trump would be a constitutional nightmare, that he would be an authoritarian. And when asked about those statements if you, uh, this weekend, his response was, I don't remember saying that. Um, and then making just a sort of, Trump is, Trump is a wonderful leader, and I'm just in awe of being able to work with him. You know, that, it wasn't exactly that, but very much like that. That kind of, um, yeah. you can't, you can't I, be even slightly critical. I, for one, welcome our new robot overlords. So, right. um, Mika, you're, you're dead in the smack in the middle of yeah. all this stuff. You want to jump in? Well, yeah, I do. And I, you know, it's interesting. I, I this morning, uh, spent about a half hour, uh, editing the draft of an article, um, that, uh, Anjal Mina is writing for us. Um, <clears throat> It, she does uh, analysis of, um, well, she looks at memes, she looks at, at fandoms, she looks at, you know, digital culture. Um, and she introduced, and, and it's an interesting piece because it's about why Trump is succeeding at dominating the sort of meta narrative or, you know, at the national media narrative, if such a thing exists. Um, and you know, there's there's a whole body of work about you know past politicians who understood or adapted more quickly to the new dominant media system uh, and then thrived because of it. So FDR and the fireside chat with radio, obviously Hitler also with mass media, uh, like you know the uh, Lenny Refson, you know the Reifenstahl's, uh, you know uh, movie, right? Um, JFK beating Nixon, if you watched the debate on TV, but not if you listened to it. Reagan as the most telegenic, you know, the pictures mattered more than the words is the thing that Deaver pointed out. Um, arguably, uh, you could say that Obama was the first to understand the power of social network organizing and big data analytics, and now here's Trump. Um, and she was even playing further and, and, and talking about how the boomlet for Oprah, um, you know, which I don't believe is real and Oprah's already said she's not going to run, but that the thing that one of the reasons why Oprah felt instinctively interesting, other than maybe we like her politics more than Trump's, um, is she is also like the king of all media, right? Um, you know, that the Trump built a, a brand, um, he, you know, around his properties that he, um, then was a big TV celebrity with the apprentice, uh, and that he understands in a hyper fragmented news environment that just being the center of conversation means that you're driving attention towards you and you're starving everybody else for attention. Um, and in the middle of the piece, she, surfaces this term from a media scholar named Penny, what's her name? I'm looking at the piece right now because I want to give appropriate credit. Money Penny? Um, huh? Is it Lori Penny? No, it's not Lori Penny. Okay. It's an academic that I had not heard of before called Penny Andrews, hmm. postdoc at the University of Leeds. And, and she talks, she introduces this term digital dissensus. Um, as opposed to digital consensus, and it, I, it it strikes me as as instinctively right that the we, we're in a hyper fragmented environment, and Trump just happens to have the biggest chunk. You know, I mean, the weakness in this argument that Trump is a master of the new media environment is that he's incredibly unpopular for a president presiding over, you know, five percent unemployment, right? and a booming stock market and all those other things, he should be at 60%. And especially if he's so good at dominating media, which he 
appears to be. Well, Peter Baker's uh, uh, opinion piece after the so, so to talk last night said exactly that. He can sell the, the country, but not himself. Like his ratings are zero, but the country's booming along. Well, he's, there's also an argument that I heard Seth Godin make recently that um, Trump's, uh, there's a type of branding where you're deliberately provoking a negative reaction. Um, and that it's a very risky way to grow your brand uh, because you piss a lot of people off, but they're all talking about you, right? Of course. Um, mm -hmm. And in the American political system, given how it actually empowers minorities over majorities, um, Trump doesn't need 51% to govern. He's got, you know, an, he's got the Republicans. <laughs> He's got a majority of self-identified Republicans. There's some evidence that the number of people who identify as Republicans is, is shrinking. But the polls don't tell you that. So when you see 80, 85 percent Republicans still supporting Trump, it may be a smaller group. But to your average Republican House member, that's their base. So they're sticking with him because he's still popular. Well, that's their base, and also because of the nature of the primary system in yeah. most states. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. But but that to your point, Jamey, about feeling you know sort of despairing at at the moment. I think a lot of it is that you know we grew up through a period where there were dominant narratives we all shared and experienced together. Right? We we there were only three sources of news every night, and that was the only thing that was on. And so you know we grew up expecting that there would be coherence. Um, and now we live in this unbelievable incoherence and Trump is just the loudest, you know, barker in the carnival. Mm -hmm. um, think, and the Democrats can't counter him because they don't have a leader. So it's, and isn't Trump very different from everybody else who was running in his party? Yes. He, I, yeah. he seems to understand and do something that nobody else got not Hillary, not the press, not anybody else. And it has to do with what you were just saying, that when you're deliberately provoking negative reactions, I mean, uh, look at uh, Benetton, right? Yeah. Benetton's ad campaigns way back when, a, a priest kissing a woman, like, all, you know, they were, but they were deliberately provoking at really intense social issues, but that was their ad campaign and it worked really, really well. They didn't have right. to do much. And, and Madonna, right? Madonna was always pushing the boundaries of culture um, to get attention. And, and sort of inoffensively, although you might have been outraged because they, she might have been, you know, pushing your buttons. But here now we have a politician who did that as, a, as an organized strategy ongoing, and it worked, and it's still working. Well, we don't know is whether it's organized, Jerry. I think it's instinctive. Yeah, uh, yeah. and, and the, it's, I it's think it's the intentional. Un it's the ongoing part that I would, that I would em emphasize, because that is, we actually have had politicians that have been um, provocateurs. Yeah. You, know, you can think about Barry Goldwater. You can think about, um, oh, what's his name in Alabama, the, the governor, Wallace, uh, Wallace. George Wallace. Um, we, have had, we have had politicians in the past, but none of them had been able to maintain a consistent, um, overwhelming narrative. And so basically they would have one big blast and then sort of settle down into something, into more yeah, into, normal into behavior. Normalcy. With, with Trump, what we're seeing, and, and I would argue we see something similar with the other trumpets, uh, trumpets around the world. The trumpet um, press. The, is this persistence of provocation. That what we're seeing is an ongoing process of every day coming up with something new. You know, that's the whole thing, the F5 o'clock. Every day is coming up with something new. Every day regaining that control over the narrative. You know, Mika said something about start, you know, starving, other, starving other people's attention or starving other players of attention. And that's right. exactly what's happening. We're seeing yep. you know, he has perfected, consciously or otherwise, perfected a method of keeping all eyes on him. But that means it is ongoing. You were well, saying... Sorry, I don't, I don't, no, I don't no, that's what I'm saying. It, it is ongoing. That, it is ongoing. Yes, that's, that's precisely my point. Yeah, yeah. I mean, somehow or other, Stormy Daniels was a mere bump in the road. Have you guys had this? I mean, I, I just looking at my own behavior, I'm, I feel like if I wake up in the morning and Trump hasn't said something outrageous, I'm are, you dis disappointed. are you disappointed? Yeah. I think I'm feeding off of kind of I, the, I totally get that. You know? And so, like, the last week or so has been a little bit calm, you know, there was no, there was no blow up at the, at the speech, you know, and it's like, ah, oh, damn, you know, there's no big thing going on. 
I think well, it's look, kind of addictive. It's it's you know it's the Facebook phenomenon. The system has been fragmented, and we're not sharing the same news reality anymore. Even the five of us don't have the same news reality. Um, I mean, I'm thinking of the one day in the last year where I felt good. Um, and I bet it was the same day that you felt good, which is uh, the, the day that, um, well, there were two of them. There was all the victories on, on the, in the November election, and then there was Doug Jones. There was the Alabama election, right? And, and, Alabama. and both of them were better than expected. But they were also moments where the old system of formalized democracy gave all of us a little atomized and, or, you know, and organized, by the way. We're not all atomized anymore. A lot of us are organized. A way to kind of go big and say, yeah, fuck you back. <laughs> um, and we had one day where, you know, we got to do that and it felt better. Um, you know, it's possible, Jamey, that a year from now, or even nine months from now, after the 2018 election, we're all going to be feeling very differently. Either we're going to be feeling a lot better because we've stopped the bleeding, or we're going to really feel worse. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I suspect it'll be the latter. I, yeah. I don't agree. Um, the reason I say that, and I, I mean it partially tongue in cheek, yeah. um, just because it's you know my job to be the uh, the doomsayer. <laughs> um, Where's your scythe? <laughs> you do need a cloak and a scythe. You need a hood and a scythe. You are in a hoodie and there. A, it looks like you've got yeah. the black hood. And, and the... you've got the beard. You... Oh, <laughs> so oh, perfect. So perfect. Looks more like Unabomber, I think. Um, <laughs> uh, the re it's partially tongue in cheek, but it's also because what I've been observing, you know, my observation of this process has been that Yes, we've had these momentary elections, but Jones would not have won if Moore had had not been such an abysmally horrible candidate person. Sure. And Jones only won by a few percent. There was still. Doesn't a matter. It was fucking Alabama. I I know. I know. Um. Which, yes, yeah, so it does make it so remarkable. Yeah. Um. But I mean, I, there, there, I think the pushback against Mueller. Yeah, I think what we're what we're seeing is the the process of trying to undermine the legitimacy of any opposition. Oh, I, I agree. I this is a terrifying moment. These last few days are are the worst I've seen. Hmm. Um, I, I think there's a it's one of the things I was thinking about the the Jones having an awful opponent component. I'm not sure that's exactly accidental. It it may be part of the system. I mean. There's a reason Trump can't get good staff, right? There's a reason this, the, the administration keeps screwing up. It's because he doesn't have that, that they're good people. He doesn't have good people because he's Trump. Not that and many people want to work for Sauron. <laughs> well, or, or incompetent people that are going to go to prison, right? And, and so I think that there's actually part of the system, and part of the reason we're seeing Nazis being pulled back into the political sphere is because we're, you know, there is a sense that the Republican Party is desperately reaching out to the margins to try to preserve its power, right? And that's not an accident. That's a deliberate thing. Okay. And it's being kind of a quality level re reaction to that. Now, I don't think we can always count on it, right? But, but it, people keep saying, well, Trump is only, if he had not been so incompetent, he would have a great presidency. Well, if he wasn't so incompetent, he wouldn't be Trump, right? I mean, you can't have both. So... Because my my game is to try to think uh, think about the what ifs, um, I can't help but think about you know what if there is an active attempt to impeach, whether it's after twenty eighteen or after you know, a Mueller report that is especially damning. Um, will the people who have been the most vocal supporters allow that to happen? allow that to happen without any kind of violence. Yeah. Yeah. Well, look, it, it, impeachment doesn't happen without the Democrats uh, taking back the House. Mm -hmm. um, and the odds are, I would say, that they do take back the House and they maybe start a process of impeachment. But the more important thing is that if they take back the House, they can block most of his bad stuff, which, I, you know, frankly, 
it's less, I mean, I'm scared that Trump is dangerous in foreign policy and that, you know, if, if you really want to scare yourself, you read these tea leaves of him talking about, I want to unify the country, but usually the only thing that unifies a country is like when something big and bad happens, would be really bad if something big and bad happened, but you know, it would unify us. Yeah. And then in the meantime, you know, his ambassador to South Korea just withdrew and said, you know, these people yeah. are nuts that we he can't withdraw. He, he was withdrawn. He was not. Yeah. He did not make the choice to withdraw. It was actually the administration chose not to push him forward. And then he published a critical piece in the Washington yeah. Post. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, he's been withdrawn because he was being critical because they're thinking of, a decapitation strike against North Korea, which is a, bl a bloody nose strategy yeah. Yeah. is the term right. they're using. Yeah. And it so, does feel like the run up to Iraq, right? It has it's, a bit of that. It's like, yep. it's like kind of like, like, you're not really doing this, are you? And, 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 and then the drumbeat continues. It's like, no, this right. is really stupid. You can't be doing this. And then, right. The drumbeat to Iraq was more coherent. I lived through that. I was part of the people who were trying to dissent against it. Um, the New Yorker magazine was in favor of invading Iraq. Okay. We, I mean, elite opinion supported Bush. Mm -hmm. Most of the Democrats voted to authorize going to war. But now elite opinion doesn't matter. So it's. Well, I disagree with you, Dave. I, I don't Fox think they, the, the sales job, look, they may take us to war. I agree, but it will not be one that, uh, like Iraq, was popular from the beginning. The, the one thing that will make it popular is if the Koreans do something stupid and give us a pretext, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know? Or the Koreans are perceived as, to have done Same something thing. stupid. That's right. Gulf of Tonkin. So yeah. I love this part of the discussion in particular because in the run-up to the Iraq war, I saw some of the best critical writing that I've seen in a really long time. And the moment the war began, all of that just vanished. It just right. went poof in a cloud of dust. And suddenly we were in a wartime situation. We had a wartime president who then got reelected, blah, 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 blah. Right. I, wanna, I wanna go back to our premise here about how do we survive the present, partly because the, the very way we started, um, I, I'm really, really interested in the belief systems we all have and the filters we're using to see the news and interpret things. And I, I think that, looking ahead and seeing different things really depends on loosening some of those filters and preconceptions in different directions and which, which is what scenario planning sort of tries to do in a right. in a structured way by driving you know quadrants of story but still the two dimensions you pick in scenario planning could be vanilla dimensions or they, you know they're very there, there are multiple methodologies it doesn't have to be yeah. the gbn style yeah um, the oh, university of hawaii has, tools. Well, you know from iftf the university of hawaii has been pushing a uh, um archetypes model where you have um growth growth decline constraint and uh, growth collapse constraint and transformation mm -hmm. and use basically those four archetypes you can fit anything into them mm. Um, I have mixed feelings about that, but it doesn't ha you don't have to be limited to just that uh, four quadrant model. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think your point is, is well taken that we have, we do try to use scenarios. We try to use forecasting models, forecasting methods as a way of stripping away the obvious bias. You're never going to strip away all of the bias, but you can try to strip away the, the obvious bias and try to come up with something you know, different visions of the future that all seem, that all seem equally plausible. Mm -hmm. You know, and you know, as you've heard me say a million times that I know I'm going to be wrong. I want to be usefully wrong. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the idea with these scenarios is that you're, you know, with any forecast is you're trying to come up with incorrect, but useful visions of what could happen as a consequence of present day drivers, present day choices, and try to figure out, okay, what do these have in common? You know, what kinds of strategy could we come up with that would actually work across these? Because whatever actually does happen, presumably, you'll be better, you'll, it'll be a better fit, which is why things like, um, you know, mules, wild cards that are completely outside our, the set of what we accept as reality are so disruptive. Mm -hmm. I'd, love to, I'd love for us to maybe share some of the ways we handle these things, because I'm realizing that one of my MOs in looking ahead 
is, and, and I do this very selectively, it all depends on my own sort of biased view of the world, but I'll take a thing that's possible in the future and I'll kind of assume it to be true. And, and I'll just kind of live in that world as if that thing were actually true. So my assumption right now, after having watched hypernormalization and reading up on Surkov and nonlinear warfare, I assume we are currently in a nonlinear war. We just don't realize it yet. And that, and that all these strategies are really quite intentional. They may not be coordinated. The people may not be as smart as we think, but this is all happening for that, which then gives, gives me tremendously different explanations for all this crap that's happening day to day and lets me bear them in a very different way because I'm seeing a different threat. I'm seeing a different dynamic going on. I'm seeing, and it gives me a little bit of plausible, predictable force on what they might try to do next. Although yeah. I haven't successfully predicted it, but, but when, then when things happen, I'm like, oh shit, that to makes total sense. That makes total sense in this scenario, which is not the scenario which I see the press doing constantly. Oh my God, look at this outrageous thing that Trump did. Soon he'll be normal again. And then the moment he's, he tr people try to normalize him, like after last night's speech, or, or the very first time he spoke in front of Congress, he looked almost presidential and Van Jones sort of saying tonight he became president. Holy crap. Um, the moment we try to normalize that again him, last night, did he? he I no, think, no, I no. He, he actually has been trying to live that down and yeah. trying to go completely I, I am on a I'm on a list with him and I attacked him. I did something that I got a lot of trouble for. I went after him personally and I was like, what the fuck did you do? Yeah. Oh boy. So I'd love for us to sort of think about and turn over, what's our MO? How do we do this? Because I realize that I do that and I've done that a couple of different ways over technology, over whatever. Like let's assume that this is going to be true. Now what happens? Let's assume ubiquitous wireless communications worldwide is cheap and everybody's suddenly on this thing. Holy crap, now what? Let's yeah. assume there's a search engine that lets you find anything. And I, I, I won't claim that I knew that one way ahead of time. But, but you know, if you can do that, it gives you a kind of clairvoyance into different future states. But if your point of view doesn't let you entertain some of those weird and difficult ones. So, so one of the ones I'm entertaining right now that I hate is what if we're at the beginning of 200 years of, of mistrust, of, no, of, of trust being broken, of facts being broken, of scientific method going away? You know, romanticism is backlash against the Enlightenment. Everybody just said, oh, screw that. We're not going to fix everything through science and Enlightenment. Let's go tell stories and let's go back to our native roots. Native, you know, Hitler runs against democracy. In 1933, Hitler is saying, look at the democracies. Look how screwed up they are. They're a shit show. Look at their economy. I can bring us back to prosperity and pride. Just vote for me, and they do. Right. Well, so, so, so what do. are these narratives? Part, well, so, yeah, not enough of them do that. That, and then he's not taken seriously. That he winds up decapitating everybody and shibbing shaboom. Well, um, I, I see Hitler's rise to power a lot like Trump's rise to power in one way. Yeah. Which is everybody in his party, in Trump's party, underestimated him. Same as the elites in Germany. And he won a game. He, he basically survived a, a, a multiplayer game where all the other players thought that they would use him to kill somebody else that was more important to kill. Exactly. And when it came time to kill him, they wouldn't unite to do it. But also, he was the only guy who pulled out the actual knives. He pulled out the knives. No, well, getting to being appointed chancellor, he didn't pull out the knives. Right. But that moment, I, I don't, I think it's rare to have a leader like that who's ready to actually decapitate, actually kill After off all that, the yeah, when he had to kill his own opponents, sure. Yeah. But, but I'm just saying that the book 30 Days to Power, which I read last year, is really interesting. And by the way, historians still don't fully understand how this happened. Yeah. You know, that at the beginning of January 1933, the newspapers had written off Hitler. They, he was like in the dustbin of history. His party was in decline. And 30 days later, he's chancellor. How did that happen? Yeah. Well, Berlusconi is uh, about to win a, win a vote in, in Italy. And once he times out on his prohibition from running for office, he could be, you know, prime minister again. Yeah. Bye, Kelly. Thanks, Kelly. So can you, Jerry, can you say more about nonlinear warfare as your explanatory frame? Sure. I, the reason why I ask is um, something interesting that popped on my radar uh, yesterday, the day before, um, because what the Republicans have just started to do this week is extraordinary. The idea that the House Judiciary Republicans are investigating the FBI right. and the Justice Department. This is the unprecedented. Best defense, the best defense is a really good offense. Well, but it's, it's talk about norm breaking, right? Mm -hmm. um, the FBI. Uh, 
which by the way may turn out to be much stronger than we we know but um the case or the fbi the fbi mm -hmm. john heileman who is a pretty centrist commentator had uh an in, he was on tv with um two democratic congressmen and he asked both of them the same question is it possible that Devin Nunes has been compromised by the Russians hmm. and that he's actually doing this because the Russians have something on him? And as an explain, you know, well, what the fuck is Devin Nunes doing? <laughs> right. But if you, if you operate from the, Oh, well, they got dirt on, you know, that maybe what happened here is the Russians in cahoots with the NRA pumped millions of dollars into the election not just for Trump, but for House Republicans. They targeted House races too. They, by the way, they hacked the DCCC, not just the DNC. Mm -hmm. And so this might explain some of the truly bizarre behavior we're seeing that isn't just the usual save your president behavior, but yeah. it's also personally this guy is compromised. So partly what you're describing, and Jamey, you can like come in after me and fill in the rest, but partially what you're describing is more more rational, underhanded strategy of the sort of dirty tricks kind or just simple blackmail uh, and other right. sorts of things. Nonlinear warfare is more confusing. And I, I, I land on that vector through Adam Curtis's documentaries, Bitter Lake and Hypernormalization. I just put a link to the Wikipedia page for hypernormalization in our chat. And basically, okay. basically um, nonlinear warfare says, hey, um, information warfare, confusing other people and winning without bullets and bombs is much cheaper than, than blowing people up. It's much, much cheaper. And, and it's insane how far you can get with it. So part of what they do is they create intentionally the fog of war. They confuse facts. They make sure that nobody trusts the media. They make sure nobody knows whom to trust. And it's right. all intentional because when you're really confused, you're going to simply pick up the narrative that makes you feel good. And if I can then, in the sea of crap, if I can then present a narrative that makes you feel like, your nationality is going to be great again. Well, you know, name, name your thing, but we're seeing nationalism rise along with populism, along with all this crap worldwide. Right. And, and part right. of it is nobody knows what to hang on to. And, and yeah. part, of, part of the problem here is that democracy and rational thinking is relatively boring in the face of this. When, when Dave says, I wake up in the morning and if Trump doesn't own the news with some new thing, I'm, I'm a little bit disappointed. I have the same, I, I'm guilty of the same feeling. I'm like, ah, damn it. He didn't do something really fucked up again. And, and in, in a weird way, you know, uh, when the election was about to happen and many people thought Hillary was going to win, it was like, oh, too bad. We won't be able to make fun of him as much anymore. Like, like the comedy, the butt of comedy was going to be off the main screen. Sure. And, and, and so, so anyway, so that's part of, part of this, uh, uh, this uh, nonlinear warfare thing. I sometimes wonder what might have happened had Hillary won. Had she spent, you know, an extra day in Wisconsin or whatever was the yeah. factor. Um, or somebody didn't click on those Facebook links and send it to a hundred of their friends. Um, what we, we, that wouldn't have changed the outcome in, the con in Congress. So we would have seen a President Clinton vilified for, having been vilified for decades, mm -hmm. um, up against a Congress that has, you know, the entire Obama, Obama presidency of experience of pushing back and obstruction. Right. And then with Trump and the Trump News Network, which was, you know, apparently the whole plan, um, being a constant, you know, a constant knife in her back about mm -hmm. everything with, with made up stories as, you know, alongside misinterpretations, alongside facts. Um, and just how depressing and miserable that would be in part because it would seem like there's just no end to this. That we just went through eight years of that, or you know, almost eight years of that with, with Obama, aside from the first few months. Um, now we're gonna have another four to eight years of that with Clinton. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, does this ever change? Yeah. Um, and one thing that I can say that, that have a, just, a, just a glimmer, a, a, uh, uh, a wintergreen lifesaver, you could flash it in in the dark of of hope is that uh, yeah uh, one of the possible consequences of this you know of, of this darkest timeline we're in is that it might actually result in some systemic level change that if we can survive trump and i mean that literally in terms of you know bloody nose strategies and all mm -hmm. if Sorry. we can survive trump then 
we might actually come out of this mm -hmm. with a more resilient system. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of what I cling on to as maybe, yeah. just maybe. Yeah. Um, you asked me when my coping strategy, uh, aside from whiskey, um, the coping strategy is in some respects um, doomsaying. Because if I try to think through all of the possible horrible consequences of what's happening now, and then it, what reality turns out to be not quite that bad, then it's actually kind of a relief. Uh -huh. <laughs> there mm -hmm. Go ahead. You want to mute your mic for a sec or take that? Or? No. Okay. It's gone. And it's funny because I have to go the other way. I have to go towards like optimism. Is mm -hmm. like if I get into the doom saying, then I just kind of like give up, and then I hit the whiskey too hard, kind of. So, so mm -hmm. I, I've had to go the other way, and like, oh, we're going to have a regenerative future, and there's this abundance possibility, and you know, it's all going to be wonderful. And I agree, it kind of is contingent on surviving the current era and the destruction of the Republican Party that exists today. But you know, then the world's going to be better, and and so, but I have to see the you know the bright side of it. Yeah, the world won't be better; it'll be different. Um, oh. and, uh, well, I want it to be better. <laughs> well, I want a pony. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, the one thing that I, at one point I try to make in a lot of the talks I give about foresight thinking is that we have to remember that for the people living in this horrible, spectacular, wonderful, uh, dystopian future, that world is normal. What they're seeing around them is, is their normal day-to-day -day life. And so we have this, uh, this luxury of perspective of looking ahead and seeing the, you know, the shiny utopia, seeing the, you know, the horrible swamp-like dystopia. We see these changes as being something different and weird, but we have to remember that for the people who are living them, this is their day-to-day -day reality, and this is what they've, they've become accustomed to. And so what frustrates me, frightens me, bothers me about the current socio-political landscape is that it makes that feeling of normalization um it challenges that feeling of normalization I, mean, I know there's been all sorts of st statements about we don't want trump to be normalized you're right but at the same time we one of the things about having this kind of um, persistent provocation you know this ongoing process of poking and poking and poking is that we never get to feel like we're having a normal life again. So, Jamey, can I just say that I, I, I completely sympathize, but I often try to think about the word, that last thing, we, we, we're not having a normal life, right? Um, so two things. First of all, is it possible that what our parents' generation experienced, the post-war boom, was was you know exceptional not typical mm -hmm. right and that you know i mean i i also i always remind myself my mother as a child was uh, her whole family had to go into hiding during the war they were luckily hidden by the resistance in belgium and they all survived but you know i mean they went through so much worse I know. And, and so, you know, whenever we, we you know, it's like put it in some perspective, okay? I mean, <laughs> I'm, I'm scared of the future going bad, and I do believe that we're running out of time to change course mm -hmm. on climate, for sure. Um, but I don't think that gives us uh, – I, I think we've just got to keep perspective against what, you know, I mean – in some ways, life is better than it's ever been in terms of life expectancy or, you know, medicine. I mean, all those people who are, who are abandoning experts still, I mean, many of them still take their medicine and go to the doctor. They right? still use so, their iPhones. Huh? They still use their iPhones. They, yes, right? They all believed that the eclipse was going to happen at the date and time that, that the scientists said it would. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I, I, Jerry's heard me you know, talk about this 50-year uh, scenario Yeah. Uh, that starts with uh, you know, economic decline, then leads into uh, you know, a period of great 
a technological transformation, but ultimately accumulates in a global scale war that where they use, where chemical weapons are used, followed immediately by a global pandemic where you actually have millions of people around the world killed, which, yeah. you know, finally you end up with a bit of an economic boom that is underscore, you know, under, you know, underpinnings are completely fragile and you know, eventually that whole thing collapses. You have a, an even bigger economic decline, which leads to the collapse of governments around the world, the rise of fascism and genocide as policy, which culminates in yet another global scale war that ends with a, you know, the shocking nuclear attack. And I've just described 1895, 1945. Right. Um, and so what you were saying a moment ago uh, about, you know, about perspective, they just smacked me in the face with my own scenario. Yeah, that, you know, we have been through as bad as this is. As of now, we have been through worse. Mm -hmm. Right, and somebody, again, all my conversations blur after a while, um, and I'm trying to remember. Oh, I know who said this. Um, I was. It was. Uh, it was Rick Hertzberg from uh, the New Yorker. We were at a, a dinner together, and um, his comment was that the the rise of nationalism is tied to uh, a generation that did not experience World War II. Right. So, you know, people who don't have a visceral memory of the horror of where nationalism takes us. Are willing to go back somehow. Yeah. It's weird. Uh, like, well, also like in Japan, I understand in the school system, they don't teach World War II. Like, mm. like Germany lives and relives it and has memorials and Germany has internalized. We fucked this up really big time and we need to keep right. poking ourselves in the soul or something might happen. So yeah. I, I trust Germany on that, despite the fact that the rise of neo-Nazis in Germany and skinheads and the whole thing. Right. Right. Um, but Japan is explicitly ignoring this. And, mm. and so we have generations of, of kids who are growing up in like really, really weird warped culture. Um, there are one and a half million hikikomori in Japan, basically shut in grown-ups who wow. didn't make it onto the escalator of get a, you know, pass a test, get a job, pass a test, get a job, whatever. Mm -hmm. They fell off the escalator and Japan is incredibly unforgiving for anybody who falls off the escalator. So mm -hmm. that and 15 other strange things going on. Um, yeah what happens when all these energies turn the wrong way? How, and, and how do we stay in contact with all these people? Because we now have an electronic back door that people can reach out through and people can find some solidarity through. Like um, the It Gets Better uh, videos that came out a couple years ago were right. tremendous because you then heard these stories of you know, Mormon kids who under, under their covers with their phones were watching the videos going, oh, okay, maybe it's going to be okay at the end. I don't have to worry about being bullied again tomorrow or I will be, but maybe there's a, there's a, you know, an exit strategy somehow. So, so right. how do, how do we handle all this? How, Shemay, help us out. How do we handle the present? It's so messy. Help me Obi-Wan Kenobi. You're our only hope. And I've, I've turned, I've turned to the Dalai Lama and the Dalai Lama is not, not really helping. <laughs> I got to get one of those cups. I got, I got no wisdom from the Dalai Lama. Oh. So I, I've been told a Dalai Lama, uh, non- quadruped Dalai Lama story ah. uh, by a guy who actually worked with him. I gave a talk with him in, in Italy. Basically, the Dalai Lama is addicted to Chinese beef jerky. Oh, really? And so he, he obviously can't go and get it himself. So basically, anyone who goes into China who, who's going to meet him later smuggles back beef jerky for him. Nice. Now, I just, I, I, that's what I always adore. But it has that. to be vegetarian beef jerky. No, that's the thing. Yeah. Real beef, beef jerky. Yeah. <laughs> um, how do we get through this? A lot of it's going to be making horrible jokes. Okay. Dolly Lama's and, and, uh, and Darkest Timelines. Yes. Um, you know, and a lot of it is going to be... Um, God. It's going to have to come through acceptance that we're, we have to wrestle with the world as it is. That we, we, whatever vision of a better tomorrow we have, whatever vision of an alternative future we have, or an alternative present we have, you know, it's okay, this is what the world is, and this is what we need to, to grapple with. You know, this is, in many respects, it's the old world-changing philosophy of, you know, we have all the pieces for a better for a better future, but we have to respond to the problems that exist. Um, and I do think, you know, despite my doomsaying 
predilections. I do think narratives of a successful future mm -hmm. will be very helpful, very, very fruitful. And I've actually been encouraging friends of mine who are comic book writers and science fiction writers to try to do stuff like this simply because having a, a common language about what a successful, resilient, equitable future could look like that is still interesting and exciting and mm -hmm. not boring and not just another Star Trek rehash. Mm -hmm. um, that I think could be really um, encouraging and enlightening of seeing that they, you know, a better world isn't just a fantasy, but is something that we can, cons we can see up from here to there. And right now it's really difficult to see from here to there. Mm -hmm. How much of this is, is what, what's it mean that we're Americans having this conversation, right? I was thinking about your example of Japan, Jerry, and I kind of immediately discarded it thinking, well, Japan's not moving the global conversation, right? If they have problems, but they're, they're insular. And they're be, shrinking. The population you know, is shrinking. And it just don't seem to be affecting the global conversation the way they, you know, they did when we were kids. Um, but, but, you know, China clearly has got this global perspective that's just wild, right? I mean, you look at the investments they're making in Africa, for example. Like, holy shit what's going on here yeah uh, so some of this seems to me that we are seeing that transition from america as you know the superpower to america as another you know we're going through our our uk moment but but and, and we have the difference that we could destroy the world on the way out you know kind of, <laughs> there's a definite tension in here but but how much of this conversation is because we are just we're sitting where we are today and I mean I part of this is also colored by the last few years we visited I, as a tourist right visited in Vietnam and India and both of those places don't feel desperate to me right I mean they feel pretty energetic and happy mm -hmm. so I, I don't know that they're having kind of this this angst and self-doubt that we're having here could that be because oh. you can't you are not able to read their social media uh, oh, I don't, I don't make it could it be sure. lots of reasons, right? It mm -hmm. could be lots of reasons. But if you go, you know, you wander through the streets of Hanoi or, or, or Mumbai, you just see a lot of busy people and you don't see a lot of beggars, you know? I mean, mm -hmm. it's, things are humming. Yeah, but actually, if you, wander, if you wander through the streets of New York or wander through the streets of L.A., you see a lot of busy people. Yeah, you know, I look out my window, I see a lot of homeless people. I'm yeah. Sitting, I'm yeah. Yeah, San Francisco is kind of the worst mess in the U.S. that way. Yeah. Hmm. I have to go. It's time. Yeah. Any well, words of wisdom? Thank you for the therapy session. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you all. I, I listed up above uh, some silver linings that I've seen from the moment, uh, which is that conversations are hot now that weren't hot before that we were kind of ignoring, that there's uh, cracks in the cracks in the system that might actually be filled by better ideas, mm -hmm. uh, stuff like that. So uh, I don't know, I, I, think, I think I tend to, to look toward those things and I'm looking for the simple suggestions that might actually change people's, the way we see what we're up against, what we're up to, where we're headed. That's mm -hmm. kind of my therapy. I, I think well, that I, I tend to, go on, Dave. Kevin Jones is, uh, you know, the regenerative economy conference he's gonna do. I mean, there is, that, there is a narrative that's kind of growing. It's we should totally have a call about that. So, yeah. Jamie, last word. I'm just saying that, I, that you know, there's a possibility that I subconsciously try to go for the the darkest scenarios and the doom saying, simply to push people through sheer annoyance into thinking something more positive, mm -hmm. because I just want it, it. just bugs the hell out of people that all I seem to come up with are horrible, horrible outcomes. Well, mm -hmm. it just tell, tells you that you need to do something better. Yeah. Right. Don't, don't follow me. Just push don't back. Don't do as I do. Exactly. Don't head toward doom. Don't follow leaders. Watch your parking meters. There oh, you go. I like that. That's so profound. But um, thank, thank you all. Thank you very much. This Bye. was a great call. Really appreciate it. Good to see you.